This is an audio recording of the Lendit Fintech Weekly News Show. The show is streamed live on Lendit TV, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter at 5 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday. In this fast-paced show, the Lendit News team and a special guest discuss the most important fintech news stories of the past week. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Lended Fintech Weekly News Show. My name is Peter Renton, Chairman and Co-Founder of Lended Fintech, joined as always by my good friend and colleague, Todd Anderson. How are you doing, Todd? I'm good, Peter. How are you? I'm doing great. And our special guest today, Jonah Crane from the Claros Group. How are you doing, Jonah? I'm well, Peter. Thanks for having me. All right. Good to have you back. So busy news week. Let's get right into it. Um, I'm going to start off in Washington, which I think is believe where are you. Do you live in Washington, Jonah? I'm right here. Six blocks from the Capitol. Six blocks from the Capitol. OK, well, you can uh, you can help us digest this first piece because we had the head of the CFPB, Rohit Chopra, was uh, testified both before the Senate and the House this week. I think it was his first Senate hearing that he's done. I think he's done the House before. But, uh, you know, as always, you know, it's it's somewhat um, you know, somewhat acrimonious, shall we say, in these in these hearings. But, you know, there was some substantive stuff that uh, that he said. Maybe, uh, Jonah, why don't you just hit us with, uh, with with what you thought the highlights were? Yeah, sure. So it was, I think, uh, a very active, uh, lively hearing. Um, I think uh, the the highlights to me were, um, you know, really the big highlight is uh, some follow through from the bureau on how they intend to address certain fees in the industry, which they've talked about for a while, right? And they put out a blog post several months ago talking about junk fees. A lot of folks wanted to know what do you mean by that. And mm-hmm. I think now we at least have some clues, right? It's clear they're they're going after. He indicated they're interested in what they can do on credit card late fees, for example, and suggested they'll revisit um, rules that were promulgated by the Fed back when the Fed had that jurisdiction. Um, that authority was passed to the CFPB and Dodd-Frank, and I think they're, you know, they're likely to revisit it. Our, uh, our understanding is, you know, there's, there's a view that the safe harbor the Fed set, the Fed set a safe harbor of like, like $25 for a first late fee and $35 or $40 for a second. And I think the, the Bureau probably intends to revisit that. So mm-hmm. that to me was the big news. I think it probably, um, you know, there was lots of other uh, lively pieces of the discussion. I think uh, policy-wise, the other, um, you know, topic that was discussed uh, a lot was the the Bureau's progress on a small business lending reporting uh, initiative that, you know, has been on, in the works for 10 years. And I think uh, uh, Director Chopra is trying to finish up and there are strong views in the in the community bank world around that, and you heard those views voiced by uh, various members of the Senate. Right. Yes, indeed. Yes, the Republicans were uh, out saying how the community banks are going to stop lending if uh, if they have to do these onerous requirements. So, anyway, there, any... I, there was another thing I, in, in reading the the American Banker piece when he talked. I think it was one of the last pieces of it when he was saying that. You know, maybe we should use the term human only or algorithm only, but the truth is it's probably good when it's both. I mean, is he trying to hint that, you know, uh, lenders using, I guess, algorithmic only, um, you know, underwriting is, is something that they're going to keep a close eye on? That's certainly my read of it. I think he's fairly, he's been, you know, he's had fairly hostile remarks about al- algorithmic decision making across financial services, um, generally speaking. So I don't think that was a surprise. I was, I took it almost as a positive sign that he, you know, acknowledged the fact that algorithmic decision making can be, you know, can improve upon human decision making from a lending perspective, may reduce bias. I think his concern is really that you have a human in the loop looking at what the algorithms are doing, make sure that they're, you know, behaving the way that you expected them to behave. And so I, I don't, I didn't read his, his comments uh, on that particular topic the other day as expressing anything that would be out of step with where I think the, the general regulatory community is on those, those topics right now, but clearly an area of focus for him. He's, he's used the word algorithmic. I don't know. Somebody should do a word search for <laughs> uh, it's a lot. Right. Right. Well, and that's, you know, that's where FinTech has obviously made, you know, they've been, the fintech community has really invented algorithmic lending, and um, you know, we, we, I mean, it's certainly resulted in lots of efficiencies for you know consumers and small businesses. But anyway, let's uh, let's move on to um, Fidelity. Uh, this was a story covered widely this week. Um, 
the Wall Street Journal reported it that uh, Fidelity is going to allow retirement savers to put Bitcoin in their 401k accounts. This is a this is a first. And you know, I didn't realize how big Fidelity was. It's on the retirement plan scene and you know they they manage 23,000 companies which okay that's that's not that many but it's 20 million people 2.7 trillion dollars AUM um, for their retirement plan so they are that's this is a major player and a may and and to have them you know really allow bitcoin is is I think groundbreaking certainly no one else is doing that in um, you know in the 401k space 20 percent can be allocated up to 20 percent can be allocated to bitcoin bitcoin only it will be initially, but uh, other digital assets should be made available down the road. And, um, you know, no, I think- it reminded me a little bit of it was kind of like the um, the consumer version of what Larry Fink said. Yeah, you know, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, the institutional version of, uh, you know, clients are asking for it yep. uh, from BlackRock. And clearly they're not going to do this unless. Um, there's a lot of people that are at least starting to ask for this. And Fidelity is, has actually been one of the earlier yep. um, you know, asset um, management companies that has looked into the digital asset space. I, mean, I think they had a head of digital assets like you know, probably 2017 or 2018, which is pretty early compared to uh, some others there. So it's not a surprise that they're first. Um, but I mean, it's certainly exciting news, uh, and I I would expect others to soon follow suit, probably sometime in the next year, maybe two. Yeah, I agree, and I think I, I, I'm sure that they're seeing some demand. I'm sure they're anticipating demand growing over time, and they're they're positioning themselves to meet it. I, I do suspect that uptake will be relatively low. The, the decision makers about whether any particular plan makes Bitcoin available. Um, you know, are going to be the fiduciaries who manage those plans on behalf of employers. And and I think that'll be a case by case decision. Yeah, I suspect if a big employer or two starts to make it available, they'll others will start to hear from their workforce. Right. So that's um, I think that's where that's where you start to see pressure. But, the you know, these fiduciaries are going to have to make a decision and they're going to have to make a decision against the backdrop where and I think this was covered in some of the articles about this against the backdrop where the Department of Labor has suggested um, they should think really long and hard about you know, how and when they make this available to uh, to retirement investors. Yeah. And keep in mind, Fidelity is doing their own custody here. This is this is all under their own roof. They're taking yeah. on a risk. And, um, you know, they, they have, they're custodying it already, I believe, for, for, for their some of their other clients. So, it was, you know, outside of retirement plans. So it's not as big of a stretch, I think, for them. Um, but uh, I think there's, a, th- this is going to be a, a trend. I think this, I mean, I really think that they've, they've, they've been, People have been calling for this. Um, I, I've seen, you know, certainly if you if you get onto Discord and any of the any of the crypto Discord, there's so much. They, they, everyone wants to be able to do it in their retirement plans. So, yeah, there, you know, there have been crypto IRA companies out there, and yep. it's, you know, they've you know they've been off to a, a hot start. So, very clear demand out there. Yep. Okay, let's move on um, to some not so good news. Um, Robinhood. You know, Robinhood has grew <laughs> tremendously uh, in the, you know, they, they, were the, they were the sort of recipients of the whole meme stock craze of 2021. They went from 700 employees to 3,800 employees uh, in, you know, really just about 18 months. And that's, that's a pretty significant clip. Now they're uh, letting go 9% of their workforce, 342 people losing their job. They, I mean, just basically they're, you know, they were, they were, they were obviously planning for a continued rapid growth and growth has tanked. Um, and um, they, they, they decide they, they are too big for, for the amount of uh, volume that's going through their platform, it seems. I also think this was a, a symptom and we saw it with better.com as well, that, you know, during the pandemic, they they threw people at at their issues, mm-hmm. and this is kind of the natural cutback from that that trading volume or interest rates go up, and so you know, loan volume and and uh, originations and real estate are starting to drop. So better has to cut back, and then this you have it more normalized because we're coming out of everyone just sitting at home and we're getting back to kind of semi-normal life. 
uh, and they are now move, removing some of those people they hired to handle the just crazy volume that they were dealing with. Mm -hmm. Seems like they did this a little bit better than better.com. Yeah, they're doing it a little better. <laughs> that's for sure. I mean, I, you know, you never want to see people get fired, but better.com was a uh, you know, case study on how not to let people go. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, no particular observations other than it seems pretty consistent with what's going on in the marketplace, especially if you look at it against last year or the year before. Um, yeah. There are brokers that got to do, uh, you know, they got to do the right thing. I'm sure they didn't take the decision to like, let 9% of their workforce go lightly. Um, particular company that's still got growth plans, right? I mean, it's not a company yeah. that's coming up on Well, growth. they're still hiring. They said they're still hiring in some positions. They just not, uh, yep. not all positions. So, so anyway, I want to move on to um, this was, this didn't really get much pickup and I was surprised, but you know, the acting um, controller of the currency, the acting head of the OCC said, uh, he made a statement on stablecoins this week, official official statement on the OCC website. Um, it was part of a, um, a talk that he gave. And he basically said that stablecoins um, need standards. He actually he pointed to the um, early internet as an example of uh, how like standards bodies got, got created. He wants... Um, he wants there to be interoperability between stable coins and uh, he thinks the OCC has, has a role to play here. He's even invited the industry to come and help academics. Um, I thought I thought this was a pretty pretty big deal that um, you know, really didn't get much play. Yeah, I think it's a big deal and I think it's a really positive indication. I think if, if you know, I, I think regulators uh, too often talk amongst themselves and I think the industry too often talks amongst itself and you end up with echo chambers, and I think it's it's uh, it's you know the industry will hopefully take him up on the invitation to participate in a dialogue around staple coins and whether it leads to the development of technical standards like the ones he alluded to and cited from the early internet days or not. You know, I don't know. I don't know that the stable coin industry is at a point of maturity where technical standards are, you know necessarily going to work um but there's lots and lots and lots of things to talk about when it comes to stable coins and if the industry and the and the regulators want to get together and talk about it then um that seems like a positive development to me um and you know he's he's expressed concern about interoperability before i think partly from a payments perspective it's mm -hmm. you know the dollar bill in my pocket's like the dollar bill in your pocket and if 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 that's not the case in stable coins what kind of risk does that pose um and, you know, he's uh, he's focused on the risks that we've seen in other uh, efforts to make various, you know, uh, blockchain based uh, products interoperable. Right. Some of the bridges between the various uh, blockchains that have been vulnerable. So um, not, you know, again, nothing particularly new out of him, but I think the invitation in the industry was a, a positive sign. And I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that this leads to something, whether it's a formal working group or something else. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll travel optimistically here. Right. I just don't see how there's any downside from the two sides talking as much as they can. And yeah, they're both in their both perfect worlds. They're probably going to lose. And, and that means the rest of us will probably win because they'll find some middle ground eventually. But the more they talk and the more they interact, the better it is for everything related to interoperability and crypto and, and whatever is the entire industry benefits. Yeah. It feels like to me that stable coins is kind of the, you know, it's it's almost like the easy one to kind of to talk about and to maybe maybe they're going to tackle stable coins first because you've seen, um, um, you know, it, it, stable coins are often have have been mentioned about you know banks should be regulating stable coins, or should be should be issuing stable coins should be regulated through the potentially through the FDIC. So there's there's definitely some momentum it feels like on that particular area and it feels easier than trying to regulate crypto and that sort of thing in general yeah well it's also it's also really important to the regulators right i mean i think they look out there and they see stable coins and while stable coins are mostly used for trading crypto these days they they have clear payment use cases and i think the regulators are you know to their credit trying to get ahead of this one i think they're playing catch up on crypto generally but on this one they're trying to get ahead of it and you know mike sue's been been thoughtful i think you know i'm I am impressed by his his you know efforts to come to grips with what's a coherent framework for for these assets, and I think he's you know there's some daylight between his recent comments on this topic and where the PWG landed, the President Working Group, in terms right. of recommending that all stable coins be issued only by insured depository institutions. And you know, in a recent interview, Sue indicated that you know they're 
they're they're exploring you know various options uh, along a spectrum um, and you know I think I think he'll want to see high standards and want to see bank like regulation for stable fund issuers because he thinks that's a better model than say money fund regulation but mm -hmm. um, it it sounds like the debate is really progressing in a substantive way again which is which is again I think a good sign. Indeed. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we're going to go across the pond. Uh, Starling Bank, that um, they are, you know, digital bank in the UK, have uh, been, uh, you know, one of the few profitable digital banks, and they've been doing really well. They just closed a hundred and thirty million um, pound um, round at a two point five billion dollar billion pound, sorry, valuation. Just from their existing investors, they have an interesting investor group. They've got Goldman Sachs. They've got uh, Fidelity. Um, Harold McPike, he's that mysterious Bahamas-based <laughs> fund manager who owns the biggest chunk of all, of, of reportedly like 40% potentially of Stalin Bank is in his hands. And then uh, and the Qatar Investment Authority, just to name a few, that's uh, the people who kicked in. They didn't go out to new investors, just wanted to get this done quickly and efficiently. Uh, Anne Bowden said, uh, the CEO, and so they're going to—they basically have made no, no. Um, they've really made it clear that the, they want to start making acquisitions. I know they're expanding here. They've got someone here in the U.S. now, um, and uh, they are going to you know, go all out to uh, become a big, big player globally. It feels like in digital banking. Seems like it's their kind of start towards the U.S. market. I mean, I know that they don't have a lot of people here. That I think they probably just have a few, but um, this does seem like it's it's preparing themselves to come into enter the U.S. market in a, a significant way, at least for them. I, I'm still curious to see if one of the bigger European success stories or UK success stories in, in neo banking can actually make a dent, or maybe not make make a dent to the chimes of the world, but find their spot because we haven't seen it yet. N26 came and, and fizzled. Revolut is still trying to figure out where they fit in. And so I'd be curious, does Starling come here with their eye on like some strategic uh, avenue and say, all right, that, that's kind of where we're going to play? Because the others have not succeeded. And I think they haven't succeeded in part because they've just broadly come in and say, all right, now we're here. Right. Yeah, it's it, it's a difficult road. I mean, I've, I've I've worked with Monzo, who you can add to that list, right? Um, and uh, it's it's a difficult road. I think Starling. It'll be interesting to see if they if they come here, whether they focus on the consumer angle first. They've got you know, I think a, a sort of business focused uh, banking and lending operation in in the UK now. Maybe that's yep. another angle. So it'll be interesting to see. I do think the general. I, you know, I think it's really interesting that they're raising money now and, and looking to make some acquisitions. Uh, it feels like a really interesting opportunity and, and, and maybe nice timing, right? Um, and while private markets haven't really experienced the same hiccup that public markets have, um, that's a pretty mild word to use, I guess, hiccup. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> right. We, we haven't, you know, private markets haven't necessarily seen the same, uh, you know, at the same, uh, it hasn't trickled all the way into the private markets yet. Um, so we'll have to see what kind of opportunities Starling finds. But it does, it does seem like probably a better time than say last year to be an acquirer. So yeah. I think uh, it'd be really interesting to watch. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm. My expectation is, and I don't have any inside information here whatsoever, just from reading the tea leaves. I think they're going to come and focus on small business. I think uh, that's what they've done. They've done a pretty major focus on that in the UK, and um, yeah. You know, what, how do they differentiate, differentiate themselves from the others if they're just going to go after the consumer? I think uh, small businesses, uh, and, and there hasn't been anyone really focusing on small businesses that's come here from from the UK. Anyway, moving along, um, I want to go back to the CFPB because this was another story that got a bit of play this week. Um, we, you know, the CFPB, they they basically have said um, and Joni, you probably have a better a better handle on exactly what this is. But there's apparently there's a dormant authority they have to treat non banks the same as banks, and um, so they're really going to go. I mean, you could be you could read this as almost uh, a threat against the fintechs um, because they're basically saying that uh, they want to be um, agile and supervised, fast growing companies. Which you know, let's face it, that's not banks for the most part, and um, <laughs> they. Um, yeah, they 
they haven't said anything specific, but um, it seems like they're they're going to get tougher with fintechs. What are you? What's your take on it, Jonah? Yeah. So, I mean, maybe I'll just do sort of regulatory nerd uh, for a minute, right? Sure. Um, so the bureau in Dodd Frank was given explicit authority to oversee uh, certain sectors: credit bureaus, mortgage servicers, uh, debt collectors. Um, and they were given there's then there was this sort of catch-all authority that said they could examine or supervise other non-banks. Now all these non-banks are already subject to the CFPB's rules and regulations around things like lending and so forth. But uh, the bureau can't necessarily show up at the door and say, "Hey, we want to examine you." Um, uh, they have to make a decision that a particular institution poses risk to consumers, and uh, and and then they can. Uh, uh, show up at the door and examine them. Um, and this is the authority that basically has not been used to date. And the Bureau, what they announced on Monday was, you know, we're going to dust this off and use it. And what they actually proposed on Monday was that the decision by the director to use this authority may be, um, may be made public. And, you know, that, of course, would be pretty controversial if a particular, you know, if one particular firm within an industry were singled out, for example, um, and the decision uh, to go supervise them because they might pose risk to consumers was made public. I can see how that would be a controversial thing. So it'll be interesting to see how the Bureau approaches this. You know, they've historically been an enforcement led agency, not a supervisory agency. Those are those are very different, uh, very different beasts. So, um, you know, we'll have to see if they, uh, you know, change their approach uh, as a result of, you know, sort of moving more towards the supervisory direction or not. Mm -hmm. But definitely, definitely wake up call for fintechs um, and, you know, particularly the largest ones, I think. But don't they have a tent? Like they can go and um, they can go, can't they go, they can go into the large fintechs, right? For the, if they're doing lenders, like can't they do that already? I thought that. They do have, they do have an authority called a larger participant. They, they can, they can identify large participants in a particular sector and, and, um, and regulate them. Um, so this is just another, another one of their, uh, another one of their tools. I mean, obviously they can, you know, as they did with, uh, with, with BNPL, they can, you know, send essentially investigative demands. They can send information requests to companies um, as well. So this is just another tool. Um, but, you know, an exam and a, and a supervisor relationship is a, is a different thing than most, than most fintechs are used to. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a pretty big step up, uh, as I think, you know, Anchorage learned recently, right? Uh, right. Uh, so it's, it's. I, I still think it's big news, but I think the big question is where are they going to focus these efforts? They can't, you know, they can't supervise every fintech out there. Far from it. So right. it'll be really interesting to see how they prioritize. Might be more work for the Claros Group. It sounds like <laughs> <laughs> shameless plug. <laughs> you said it. Anyway, <laughs> anyway let's move on. Um, yeah, Lending Club reported earnings this week. I think it was just yesterday. If I if I'm in my memory serves me, um, they, you know, because the, the, they're a bank, they have, they actually, they get to report before all the other fintechs now because they have banks have like this like 30 day window where they have to report after the end of the quarter. And so lending club, another, another great, great earnings um, you know, report, really 39 cents a share uh, in, in profits, revenue, 289 million, both ex beating expectations. You know, revenue was up 174% year over year. Uh, they got to, they, they always been saying they had 3 million members. Now they've got over four. Um, bank deposits, um, $4 billion in bank deposits, I think Club has now, because you know, they've obviously had Radius Bank they, acquisition completed uh, over a year ago. But, um, you know, they've, they've, they're really, I think, you know, they, they talked about, the acquisition of Radius Bank really being a driver of profitability, and it just seems like they've uh, that's happening. Their stock was up uh, over eighteen and a half percent today. I mean, I still find it pretty amazing how far Lending Club has come from you know 2015, 2016. It felt like they were in that at their low point, like they were about to be kind of scooped up from someone. And from there to where we are today is just nothing short of, of amazing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, while they used to be more along the lines of, of flashier announcements and stuff like that, they've kind of, at the same time, have gone quiet uh, and have just consistently performed, uh, especially uh, since buying and, and acquiring 
uh, Radius Bank. And um, I think it's a, it's a real success story that others should start taking note of uh, and thinking, you know, how can we replicate what Lending Club has done, especially now that they're a bank, which provides so much more opportunity than where maybe some fintechs are today. And they're going to soon find themselves in like this weird moment of where do we get acquired or do we kind of begin this road or this path? And Lending Club gives them a clear example of what to follow. Yeah, it's a, I totally agree. I think they've just executed spectacularly um, on their strategy. They, uh, you know, the acquisition has turned out to be, um, you know, really a plus. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a really notable example for the fintechs out there, in particular in the lending space, right? I think there's a general presumption that, you know, becoming a bank is, not necessarily desirable, and it's certainly not for everybody. But I think Lending Club is showing why there are so, such advantages to that. Uh, if you're in the lending space, right? I mean, we're in a world right now where the capital markets are a little dicey, and guess what? Lending Club's saying, "Well, we'll ho- hold more loans on our balance sheet," and those are very profitable for us, by the way, because we can fund them with deposits. And uh, I think their loans, you know, their balance sheet, uh, the loans on their balance sheet are, I think, I think more than doubled year over year. Um, it's, uh, it, it just shows the, the strength of having, you know, being able to do both and they're, uh, they're, they're well-practiced at, you know, selling into the capital markets too. So I think they've, they've just executed really well. Yeah. Makes you wonder if the other, there are all the other online lenders that, um, looking at lending clubs numbers now and thinking, wow, we, maybe we should go get a banking license or buy a bank. You probably know more about that than I do, Jonah, but we're not going to go there now. Uh, so finishing up our last story, I'm really pleased about this one. You know, the the old, uh, the SBA 7A program is the most popular program. It's what we all, it's, you know, the government, government guaranteed loan um, from the SBA, 90, like 90%, I believe, uh, government guaranteed. Um, there's only 14 non-bank or non-depository um you know, lenders that uh, have these licenses and, um, you know, it's very highly, uh, highly sought after, but, um, you know, Lendistry, which, you know, I've had him on the, on the podcast. We've had him, we've had uh, Everett, Everett Sands. He's a good friend of lenders has spoken at our events and they've, uh, they've snatched up one of these, um, you know, one of these licenses now and we'll be doing uh, SBA lending under the 7A program, uh, which, you know, obviously you can have fairly large loan sizes and, and there are, you know, Lendistry is a CDFI. They've really been focused on minority minority businesses, often smaller loans, and they were in another SBA program, but this this sort of gets them into the big time and uh, you know, pleased, to, pleased for them to have, you know, to basically have a, a, a chance to do 7A lending now. Yeah, it's great. I think we learned in, uh, you know, in the early days of the pandemic when they were rolling out the original PPP program, you know, just how important it was to have people who were more tech enabled, um, you know, could bring more automated underwriting to bear um, and, you know, just simpler, better user experiences to uh, the application process. And, you know, we saw that play out in space in the early days of the pandemic. So, you know, I, I hope there's more to come. I hope there's more to follow um, uh, in terms of bringing some non-depositories and more tech-focused people into the SBA program. I think they're good programs um, and they would benefit from, uh, you know, having a broader broader array of lenders in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, to me, like I would have thought the PPP, FinTech, um, you know, processed, a good chunk of the number of loans that went through, and I, I like. I think I would have thought by now that there'd there might be some momentum behind the whole. Let's get fintechs more uh, more SBA more SBA licenses because they really, I think, in many ways, saved the PPP program. You could talk about the fraud. Sure, there was a little bit of fraud, but. I mean, I mean, companies like Lendit, we, we, I don't know if we would have made it without the PPP program. I know many, many companies that really benefited tremendously from the PPP program. And, uh, you know, I, I, but, you know, there hasn't really been any movement, right, in, in, uh, in getting new lenders on board. Do you think it's because of, of some of the, I guess, high profile discussions around the fraud that like regulators or like 
it put like this cloud over fintech, even though it was an unfair cloud because the government wanted the money out the door as quickly as possible. They were probably willing to just, all right, there's going to be fraud. We need to get businesses saved. Uh, and it seemed like the like on the backside, fraud became the bigger topic versus, hey, fraud needed to be a, a consideration because we needed to save hundreds of thousands of businesses. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not really sure, um, you know, what's... It, you know, it, I don't know even that there's a lot of demand out there uh, from fintechs to get into the ordinary, S, you know, SBA 7A program or not. Uh, there's not, but, there's some. We know there's some. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Funding Circle have been pushing for it for years. Yeah. But, um, well, I would I would hope that they'll that they'll rethink that. Um, but you know, yeah, it's it, maybe they're maybe they're still sort of in recovery mode from PPP, which I know was just a massive undertaking for SBA. Yeah. Yeah. Understood. Anyway, we are out of time. So thank you very much, Joan. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks always, Todd. Thank you to yeah. you, the, Thanks, the listener thank or you. the viewer. Appreciate your time. Before we go, though, quick reminder, we are now less than four weeks away from Lended Fintech USA happening in New York. If you haven't got a ticket, you should join the entire fintech world that will be descending on New York May uh, 25th and 26th. So with that, I will wish you a, a, a good afternoon and we'll be back uh, same time next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. See you.